In this video, we're gonna prove the first Seeloff theorem, which is similar to Cauchy's theorem, both in its statement and in its proof. We really can think of the first Seeloff theorem as a generalization of Cauchy's theorem. So recall that Cauchy's theorem says that if you have a finite group and you have a prime that divides the order of that group, then you have a subgroup, which is necessarily cyclic, mind you, but you have a subgroup of G whose order is P, that prime that divides it. Seeloff's theorem is going to generalize that. So if P divides the order of the group, in fact, if P to the R divides the order of the group, where R is some integer power of P there, then G has a subgroup of order P to the R. So Cauchy's theorem is just the case where you have P to the first, right? So that's the situation where R equals one. Seeloff's first theorem generalizes that. So if P squared divides the order of the group, you have a subgroup of order P squared. If P cubed divides the order of the group, you have a subgroup of order P cubed. If P to the fourth divides the order of the group, then P, there's a subgroup of order P to the four. That's what the first Seeloff theorem gives us. We're generalizing Cauchy's theorem. And the proof of the first Seeloff's theorem is actually almost identical to the proof of Cauchy's theorem we just saw. There is one critical difference that we will see, and at that moment, we actually will need to use Cauchy's theorem, which is why we couldn't just do it all at once. We had to do Cauchy's theorem first, then the first Seeloff theorem. All right, so how's the proof go? Like Cauchy's theorem, it's going to be proof by induction on the order of G. Of course, if you have the trivial subgroup, this statement we're trying to prove is vacuously true, so we move on to a non-trivial subgroup. If the order of the group is a prime, then the group is necessarily cyclic, and this statement is true for cyclic groups, because for a cyclic group, you have a unique subgroup for every divisor of the order of the group. In particular, you'll have a subgroup whose order is a power of prime. You get all of them, but in particular, you have the powers of the prime. So then we're going to proceed by induction. Uh, the induction hypothesis will be that all groups whose order is less than the order of G assume the result holds for them. We then are going to rely upon the class equation. So if the order of the group, the order of the group is going to equal the order of the center of the group plus the sizes of each of the non-trivial consciousy classes for that group. So remember that um, by, by group actions here, if you have the conjugation action working on the group, then the centralizers will be the isotropy subgroups of the conjugation action. The index of the centralizer then gives you the size of that orbit, the size of the consciousy class. And then the center of the group is the collection of every those elements which commute with everything. And therefore, those are the elements whose consciousy class is just themselves. They're trivial. So this, the class equation gives us a partition of the group with respect to the conjugation action. Now, the elements x1, x2, all the way up to xk, these are representatives of the k non-trivial consciousy classes. In particular, these are elements which are non-central. Therefore, their centralizers will be proper subgroups because there's at least something that doesn't commute with it. So not everything commutes with it. That proper statement will be important when we get to induction. So the first assumption is suppose there's one of these centralizer indices that's not divisible by P. Well, apply Lagrange's theorem. Lagrange's theorem says we can factor the order of G using the order of the centralizer and the index of that same centralizer. We know by assumption that P to the R divides the order of G. So by Euclid's lemma, these P's have to divide the other side, but by assumption, these P's can't divide the index. So all R of the P's are gonna have to divide the order of the centralizer. Now, since the centralizer, like we said, it's a proper subgroup, uh, the induction hypothesis applies. And since P to the R divides it, that means we get a subgroup of order P to the R. That subgroup of the centralizer is a subgroup of the whole group, and therefore we have the subgroup that we desire. Let's move on to the next one, okay? The next one, what if P divides all of these indices? Well, by assumption, P to the R divides the order of G, um, so in particular, P by itself, because uh, R is at least one, right? Uh, G, P will divide the order of G. So P divides all the indices, it divides the order of G. So by the class equation, P is gonna divide the order of the center. This is where Cauchy's theorem is gonna come into play here. Since P divides a group, the center, by Cauchy's theorem, there's an element little z inside of the center whose order is P. 
let's take capital Z to be the cyclic subgroup generated by little z. Now, this right here is a very important observation, not just for this proof, but in general. Whenever you take a subgroup of the center of a group, it's always a normal subgroup in the entire group. Um, to prove this, I want you to remember that a group is a subgroup is normal if and only if it's closed under conjugation. If I take an element, if I take an element inside the center, call it X, and I take an element of the group, and you conjugate a central element by any elements in the group, since it's central, it'll commute. X and G inverse will commute. G and G inverse cancel out. You just get back X. So if you take any central element and you conjugate it, you get back X. That was what we saw early with the class equation. But because the conjugation action is just the identity on central elements, any subset of the center is closed under conjugation. So if you take a subgroup of the center, that's a subgroup that's closed under conjugation. So it's a normal subgroup. So subgroups of the center are always normal in G. So this is a very common trick. We take a single element of the center that has the property we want, such as its order P, and then that subgroup by itself will be normal. What do we do with normal subgroups? We mod them out. I want you to consider now the quotient group of G mod Z. What's going on there? Well, let's consider the order of G. Well, the order, excuse me, the order of H. The order of H will be the order of G divided by the order of Z. We don't know a whole lot about G, but we do know that the order of Z is P. And so G divided, the order of G divided by P will be something strictly smaller than the order of G. So the inductive hypothesis applies to the group G mod Z. Now, because we took away a factor of P, we knew that P to the R divided G, the order of G, so then we can infer that there's a subgroup of H whose order is P to the R minus one. So we lost one of those P factors because P to the R minus one divides the order of G divided by P because of the same right here. Okay, that's okay though. Take that subgroup, if we lift it back up to G, so we take a subgroup of H, it lifts, to a subgroup of G by the correspondence theorem, that subgroup we just lifted back up will have order P to the R, which then gave us the, or the subgroup of P to the R that we were looking for. And therefore the result follows by induction. Now that we've proven the Seeloff first theorem, I'm actually ready to define what is a Seeloff P subgroup. So given a finite group G, uh, let P be some prime divisor of the group. We say that a subgroup is a Seeloff P subgroup. Typically, we'll call this capital B, capital P. It's a Seeloff P subgroup of G if it's a maximal P subgroup. What does maximal mean in this situation? Maximal means that if Q is a P subgroup and if P is a subgroup of Q, then we actually have that P equals Q. So it's maximal in the sense that it's maximal of the lattice on the lattice of P subgroups. Any P subgroup that contains a Seeloff P subgroup is actually the Seeloff subgroup itself. You can't have a larger P subgroup than that. Um, and then the collection of Seeloff P subgroups will denote S, Y, L sub P of G. Now I should mention that the Seeloff subgroups of, of any group are extremely important. These are an extremely important topic for finite group theory. And so now that we, now that we have um, Seeloff's first theory, imagine that, you know, suppose that P to the R divides the order of G, but P to the R plus one does not divide the order of G. Consider that situation. So that's the, so P to the R is the maximal number of primes that divide the order of G. By the first Seeloff theory, there exists a subgroup, there exists a subgroup P such that the order of P equals P to the R. Now, if there was a P subgroup that contained capital P, its order would have to be strictly bigger. It would have to be P to the R plus one, but that's not possible by Lagrange's theorem. Therefore, this group P 
is necessarily maximal and aka it's a Seeloff subgroup. So the first Seeloff theorem, phrased slightly different, says Pilaf P, uh, uh, Seeloff P subgroups exist. So the first theorem really is the existence of Seeloff subgroups. Um, when the when the prime in consideration is clear from context, it's often omitted. You just say a Seeloff subgroup there. Uh, and so the first theorem tells us that Seeloff subgroups exist. The way we phrase it is actually a little bit stronger. We're saying there are subgroups of order P to the R, P to the R minus one, P to the R minus two, P to the R minus three, P to the R minus four, all the way down until we get to P. So we have all these different ones. Um, but there's a little bit of a trade-off that we got from that, that way of phrasing the first Seeloff theory, the theorem there, is that we're saying Seeloff subgroups are maximal. Maxim, if you have the maximum order, that necessarily will make you maximal. But that doesn't mean that every maximal P subgroup has the maximum order, right? Could it be possible that like P cubed divides the order of G, but could we have a Seeloff subgroup of order P squared? Because it's maximal in the sense that no other P subgroup contains it. There's no subgroup of order P cubed that contains this subgroup of P squared. Is that a possibility? Well, by the second Seeloff theorem, which we'll prove in the next lecture, we'll actually find out that's not a possibility. Um, but we want to consider just some examples of Seeloff subgroups at the moment. So consider an abelian group like Z12. Um, if you have order 12, that factors as 2 squared times 3. Um, Z12 does have a subgroup of order 3. Notice 3 to the first is the biggest power of 3 divides 12. If you take the subgroup generated by the element 4, that'll give you a subgroup of order 3. And in fact, that's the only subgroup of order 3. This group would have a unique, has a unique Seeloff 3 subgroup. Um, because actually there's no other 3 subgroups of the group at all. Um, what about 2 on the other hand? Well, the group Z4 does have a subgroup of order 4. Um, it's the group generated by 3. 3, the cyclic subgroup generated by 3, and it'll be a Seeloff subgroup because it has order 4. What other two subgroups does the group have? Well, there's also the group generated by 6, which will be isomorphic to Z2, but I should mention that this is actually contained inside of the subgroup generated by 3. So it's not, so it's a 2 group, but it's not a maximal 2 group, and therefore it's not a Seeloff 2 group. So it turns out this is the only Seeloff's two group. Um, so the cyclic group of order 12 has a unique Seeloff three subgroup and a unique Seeloff two subgroup. Let's look at a non-abelian example or two. Um, S3 is a non-abelian group. It's the symmetric group on three letters. Its order is six. Um, so its prime divisors are two and three. It has a unique subgroup of order three that's just the alternating group, A3. That's the only three group in the entire group. Um, it actually has two, uh, excuse me, it has three two subgroups. If I take the cyclic subgroup generated by any of the two cycles, that gives you a two group. They're each isomorphic to Z2. Um, it's a two group, and they're going to be maximal because they have the maximum order of a two group. And so you actually have three distinct Seeloff two subgroups. A group can have distinct Seeloff subgroups. Um, if we come to D4, D4, the dihedral group, its order is eight, which is two cubed. D4 is itself a two group because its order is a power of two. And therefore, it is a maximal two group because it's the largest group subgroup possible so if your group is itself a p group then it's its own seeloff p group uh so it's it's so the the group itself is it's seeloff two subgroup which of course is unique in that situation um you could say the same thing about q8 the quaternion group of order eight because it's a two group it's its own seeloff two subgroup let's come down to a4 this is a very interesting non-abelian group to consider its order is 12. So just like Z12 we did earlier, right? It has order four and order two for the, the, the prime powers there, two squared and three. Um, A4 has a unique Seeloff two subgroup. 
And that's actually going to be the Klein 4 group, which you see right here. You have the identity and all the 2-2 two, two cycles. Now, the other two subgroups of A4 consist of just taking the identity in one of the two, two cycles. But those all live inside of the Klein 4 group. So the Klein 4 group is the only maximal seal, uh, the only maximal two subgroups, so it makes it a Seeloff 2 subgroup. It's unique. Um, but in A4, you have lots of you have lots of three subgroups. One of them, you just pick you just pick your favorite three cycle, like one, two, three. Then the cyclic subgroup generated by it gives you the identity, it gives you one, two, three, and it gives you one, three, two. Like so, that gives you a three group. And because three is the largest power of three that divides A4, there's no larger three subgroup than this one right here. So this makes it a maximal one. This makes it a seal off one. But this is the one we get if you generate it using one, two, three. If you use any of the other three cycles other than one, two, three and its inverse, you can get a different one. And so it turns out that A4 actually has four Seeloff three subgroups. So this is something we've seen so far that we can have multiple Seeloff subgroups or we can have unique ones. Now, some interesting patterns here is that when the Seeloff subgroup was unique, it actually was normal. And when it was distinct, they're not normal. But even when they're distinct, they're still isomorphic. All of the Seeloff 3 subgroups of A4, of A4 here are cyclic subgroups of order 3. They're all Z3. So that's sort of an interesting thing. When it's unique, it's normal, uh, if and only if. And when they're different, they're still isomorphic to each other. Um, and this is the, we're going to prove these observations with the second and third um, Seeloff theorems, which we'll do, of course, in the next lecture.